Good morning. Um, when we sing, you know, we're going to have each little section do parts. Uh, yeah, we're, the bass is over here, and the tenor, and alto, and soprano. Um, no, we won't do that, but unless you really want to, because I can't help you, because uh, I can maybe help you with soprano, but when it comes to the bass part, mm -mm, I can't do that. <coughs> you have the announcements and various things in your worship folder. Be certain that you look at that because I'm not going to read through it. I'm, you're an intelligent, good-looking crowd. I don't need to do that. So anyhow, with um, that in mind, and by the way, this is Sarah Anderson because I've had people ask me, who's playing the piano? She is, and it's not me. So, and there's good reason. And now we have a video. Thank you. 
And now if you would direct your attention to the screens and join me as we do the call to worship in unison. Join me, please. I will send down showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And now for the invocation, which is also in unison. So join me again, please, as we pray together. We give humble thanks to you, most gracious Lord, that you hear our prayers when we call upon you. We rejoice in the great things you have done. Fill us with your presence as we worship you this hour. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. And now if you would stand, please. This song is 327, if you wish to use the red hymnal. If not, the words will be here on the screens, as is our custom. <coughs> may be seated as we continue with the prayer of confession. Join me as we pray together in unison, please. O oh Lord, we are asking you in your mercy to hear our prayers. Forgive those who confess their sins to you. By your mercy, pardon and forgive. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now for the Psalter. And would you please respond where you see the yellow print? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. For God has founded it upon the seas. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts. They will receive blessing from the Lord. Such is the generation of those who seek the Lord. Who seek the of the God of Jacob. 
And now, if you would, please stand again as we sing freely, freely. It is page 389. This is Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. A psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is the word of the Lord. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I've not really met anybody real famous. I did meet Al Linder. Now, most of you go, who in the world is Al Linder? Well, obviously, you don't fish. If you fished, you would know the answer to that. If John was here, he would be going, amen. Well, Al Lindler is a fisherman from way back. Um, he comes from Minnesota, Bemidji, I believe. He and his whole family have been involved in fishing. I went to hear him speak, and it was an interesting event. He talks about fishing like a Southern Baptist preacher talks about sin and salvation. I mean, he gets, he gets rocking. And I said to one of my prisoners, it sounds like we're in a revival. He said, yeah, I know. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, I went there because you get a picture of yourself with Al Linder and a replica of the world record walleye. Now, Al Linder was fine, but what I really wanted was a picture of me with that world record walleye. Okay, that's how that works. So um, he was holding it, and I helped him, and... I felt really good, and yes, I have a picture. It's in my photo album of what I call dead things. Um, when I go hunting and fishing and that kind of stuff, we take pictures. They're all in this album that I affectionately call the dead album. Um, so people ask me, what in the world is that? It's, well, you look. Oh, I see. Okay, never mind. Um, so he's, but he's not dead, okay? He's still living. The plastic walleye, I don't know whatever happened to that. But he's still living. I don't want you to think he's, hmm, that didn't come out like what I meant. Well, anyway, um, there's all kinds of famous people. I've never met any of them. Some people say they'd like to meet Chuck Norris. 
I might like to meet Chuck Norris, but I want it in the daytime. I want it in a place where I just meet him and we shake hands or something. I don't want to meet him in any other way because he has a reputation. Um, you know, he's, he's a Hollywood uh, celebrity. He's also a very famous martial artist, and um, he was the six-time undefeated pro world professional middleweight karate champion and the first human being in the Western Hemisphere to earn an eighth-degree black belt in Taekwondo. So even at 70 or 75 or whatever he is, he's still not someone you want to mess with. Well, I found some facts about Chuck Norris. Sort of facts. Here they go. Did you know the fear of spiders is arachnophobia? The fear of tight places is claustrophobia. The fear of Chuck Norris is called logic. Chuck Norris has a grizzly bear uh, carpet in his room. The bear isn't dead, it's just afraid to move. Those are the silly things that, that you hear. Um, Chuck Norris and Superman which fought each other on a bet. The loser had to start wearing his underwear on the outside of his pants. So, so we know Superman, if you, yeah, okay, there you go. Um, Chuck Norris once counted to infinity, twice. This is the one I really like. Well, there's two more, there's two of them, but this one I think is hilarious. When the boogeyman goes to sleep every night, he checks under his bed and in the closet for Chuck Norris. Now the last one is this. When Chuck Norris does a push-up, he isn't lifting himself. He's pushing the earth down. So, you know, all of that's nonsense. Um, I've never met Chuck Norris. I've never met many earthly kings. I've never met any presidents. It, my, my favorite de presidents are all dead. You know, you, uh, you got to love those dead presidents. Like on the $50 bill, the $100 bill, the 20 the 10 the 5 Now, George, bless his heart, why do they stick George Washington on a 1? And Andrew Jackson, of all people, on a 20? Well, I don't like Andrew Jackson. I never met him, but I don't like him. I don't like what he did. I wouldn't like him if he were alive today, and he'd probably beat the daylights out of me with his hickory cane, like he had, did the person who tried to shoot him. Um, I'm not many earthly kings. Maybe you have. I haven't. But I have met one eternal king. And for those of you here and watching on the live feed, if you've encountered Jesus Christ, you've met the greatest king of all times. It wasn't Elvis, trust me. For Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and if you're a follower, there's good news. You don't have to get an appointment to meet him. You don't have to make a reservation. You don't have to have political connections. And you don't have to have a certain amount of money. In fact, when you think you've left him, you find out he's never left you. So we're going to talk for just a few minutes about being up close and personal with God. You see, God is a personal God, not just a powerful God, but a personal God who wants to have a relationship with each one of us. A relationship that is spiritual, emotional, eternal, and above all else, personal. So when you come into God's presence the right way, with the right heart and the right spirit, you're able to get up close and personal every single time. So here are some of the keys. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. In other words, worship God joyfully, or joyfully worship God, whichever way you want to put that sentence together. You see, worship is the way we primarily make our way to a personal contact with God. It's so important that the first four commandments in the Ten Commandments all deal with worship. And the book of Psalms talks a lot about worship. And no psalm talks any more about worship than the one we're looking at today. 
Now, the worship that we find in Psalms is a little different than most of us have experienced in our lifetime. Now, <clears throat> the word for noise in here literally means a sound that splits the ear. I hear more of that sound at a football game than I do in worship. In fact, I was talking to Sarah about some of the folks at the football game, and it wasn't worship. I'll guarantee you that. Not the words coming out of their mouths. Um, but then you know how that works. I, I grew up in Kansas City, part of my life, and those chief fans, they have, I still believe now, they own the record again, for the loudest stadium, maybe of anywhere. Yeah, the noise approaches it's 120 decibels plus, if I remember right. Um, if I'm going to go to a Chiefs game, I'm getting earplugs. I'm for sure going to turn my hearing aids off. Um, that's a, a splitting noise I don't really need to hear. I don't think I've ever been in a worship service where the joyful worship was ear splitting. Maybe in eternity one day, that might be an ear-splitting sound. Not a bad way, but in a good way. Now, Methodists used to be known as people who sang too loud and were too enthusiastic about worship. I find that a little odd that you would complain about people being too enthusiastic about worship. And I have friends that are Pentecostals, some of them, and... We've had discussions about why God raised up the Pentecostals. Now, some of them say, well, just because we're supposed to speak in tongues, I, said, mm, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's it at all. So why do you say that? Well, not every Pentecostal I know speaks in tongues. And if that was the reason, then to be a Pentecostal, you'd have to speak in tongues, and they don't all speak in tongues. Well, why do you think God raised him up? I said, because worship in the United States got really boring. And dead and along come the Pentecostals as well as the Charismatics and suddenly they brought a lot of energy into a worship scenario now do I agree with their belief no there's several things I don't agree with but I'll tell you one thing I appreciate they brought some life back into worshiping God and goodness knows we needed it. They would have come the closest I know of to that noise that is ear splitting. But I don't think showing too much motion is our problem today. I think we don't show enough. Because what? Well, my relationship with God is, is private. No, it's not. No, it's not. Nope, nope, nope. Personal? Yes. Private? Uh -uh. Wrong. Your worship of God and my worship of God, but the way we live, is not a private event. We live it out in front of people around us. Now, I've met my share of fanatics, okay? And, and sometimes they just drive me nuts or make me nuttier than I already am. Might be a better way to put that. I can't hardly take it because they never relax. And I want to find some Valium for them so they'll just come down a couple of notches. You're making my anxiety go through the roof. I still love them, but they, they need to just calm a little bit. Just, just, just a little. But here's the deal. It's easier to tone down a zealot, or if you want to put the word fanatic, you can, than it is to raise the dead. Much easier to tone down a zealot than it is to raise the dead. So it's okay to put some volume with your singing. At the end of the first service, um, the, the congregation, they, I'll just put it this way, they really belted out the last song. That's probably not a very spiritual term, but I think you understand. It was amazing. I loved it. Now, over in Gregory, um, Sometimes I pick songs that 
nobody could sing, including me. That doesn't make for a very ear-splitting sound. Well, it's ear-splitting, all right, but it wasn't a positive way. But you pick songs that, we, that, that, that they know and they really like and stand up to sing. Um, they raised the roof on a few occasions. We had a DS in there once sometime. said, um, boy, you people are, you kind of worship crazy in this deal. And it was meant as a compliment. I've been in places where, you know, people sang their hearts out. Did they all sing in tune? No. No. I had a, con- a, a congressional, a congressional, <laughs> congregational member up in North Dakota. And she said, I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't sing, so I don't sing. I said, what do you mean? I can sing one note. She said, I'm monotone. I want you to know she was telling the truth. She was monotone. Uh, she said, so I... I don't sing. I said, well, just come up front and sing then. Oh, that's a good idea. Hilda is her name. Wonderful saint of God. And I said, sing to your heart's content. Because God doesn't care if you're on key or you're not. God's listening to your heart, not your voice. And when she sang from her heart, It was a beautiful thing, and I know God loved every minute of it. Well, we're also called to serve God with gladness. Now, it says worship, but the fact is, if you're going to worship God, the lifestyle you live and the way you serve those around you is an integral part of worship. Now, I think in here you put a thank you. Did you not, Vanessa? We are thankful And then there's a whole list of people whose service is being recognized. You know what? There's a whole group of servants that you don't see in this. But I'm here to tell you, God does. Now, however you act out your service for God, we're all gifted differently. Uh, We all have different... um, you know, um, callings, if you will. But you can tell usually how close you are to God by your willingness to serve. Now, I'm not, I'm not defining what that is, okay? What I discovered in my own life, um, I'm kind of hard-headed. That's my dad used to say I had, a, I had a head like a concrete block. And, and he wasn't being mean. He was just truthful. I really do. And was very, very selfish. Um, I could explain all that. I'm not going to because we don't have time for that. But I did go to a counselor to find out why I was so um, narcissistic. And it was pretty simple. Well, I will explain it. I went to three high schools, three middle schools, three grade schools, And that didn't include kindergarten. That was a different school, too. We moved all the time. So he asked me, so how did you deal with that? I said, I shut people out. You know, because I knew I was only going to be a certain length of time. I wasn't going to extend myself any further than absolutely necessary. And he said, so who did you rely on? Me. Me. I said, there it is. I went, oh. I never thought of it like that. I said, it's a survival technique for you. So you catered to yourself because in your own insecurities, and rightfully so, there wasn't anybody else to do it. Oh. Now, I wouldn't have gone to him early on when I got married because I wasn't really interested yet in trying to figure out why I was so narcissistic. I really wasn't interested in not being narcissistic. And I always said to Sherry's exit from this earth, you're an incredibly intelligent and beautiful woman, but your choice of a man couldn't be worse. I said, you're really poor at at picking a spouse. You know that? Uh, She went, yeah, I know. I get up every morning and ask myself why. 
one fault in her character. But the whole time that she struggled with her, her multiple sclerosis, I can't tell you that at the beginning I was serving with gladness. More like I was serving with resentment. See, I'm a bit of a control freak. I try to hide it really carefully, but, but I'm a control freak. And um, that's not the most spiritual thing in the world because that's saying I can take care of it because God's not doing a good enough job kind of thing. And so one thing about MS is no day is the same. The, the most consistent thing about it is its inconsistency. And let me tell you something. If you're a control freak, well, that's a tough pill to swallow. I never got angry at her. I did get angry at that illness, but then she was too, so it's okay. But over time, because of my love for her, and quite frankly, her love for me, and she helped me learn to be more of a servant. And what I discovered over the years, the more I focused on her and the less I focused on me, the happier I became. Now that go, runs counter to our culture. Our culture says you need to look out for you and you only. The rest of the people, they can make it on their own. You're the most important thing in your universe. It's not true. The more I focused on her and the less I focused on me, the happier I got and the more grateful I became to be alive. Now, I wouldn't bring her back to that life for anything. Would I do it again? Yes. I'd do it the same way I did the first time. I'd ask God to help me, because I can't do that by myself. You know, I got to <laughs> so focused on her that when she died, I was completely lost. Just absolutely lost. Now, she had been in a nursing home for four years, but I had focused taking care of her, and she wasn't there, and now I didn't have her to focus on. And it's still a little bit of a struggle for me. You know, one of the things I thoroughly enjoyed, I bought her clothes. Now, I realized that a man shopping in the uh, women's department of J.C. Penney's all the time is not something you see that often. And now I can't say the name of the brand. I said it this morning, but now it's gone. Um, I knew her size. And they had, you know, they had matching stuff. That's important. You won't get in heaven if you're not matching. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm matching all the way my socks, my boots. And I'll just leave the other part out, but it matches too, Okay. I mean, because I want to be spiritual, and if you're spiritual, you have to wear matching clothes. At least that's the way I look at it. And so I would go to J.C. Penney's and buy her clothes. And I knew her size and knew exactly what I needed. I could match them up. I could get them together and would, like, you know, spring came. I took out the winter clothes that I bought. And Alfred Dunner, there we go, that's the brand and uh, put in the new spring ones. And then when summer came, I would go buy new summer clothes and take out the spring clothes. And then when fall came, out went the summer clothes into uh, storage, and I bought new fall clothes. And when winter came, I took fall clothes out and bought new ones for winter. And she didn't, I didn't buy um, what do you call those, like the T-shirt and the pants that go together? What are those called? They're, they're like jogging stuff. Sweatpants. I didn't buy sweatpants and a sweatshirt. <laughs> and I did the laundry, too, because I didn't want anybody to mess up her clothes. And they used a lot of hot water in a nursing home. And these clothes don't like hot water, and they didn't want to do them anyway because he said, we'll mess them up, and then we'll have to pay for them. So I loved even doing the laundry, which is like, Seriously? Why? I don't like doing laundry now. 
You know why? Because it was hers and not mine. And I tell you that not because I'm so special and so spiritual, because I'm not. I was a King James donkey. You can figure that out for yourself, what I mean by that. You go look it up. Balaam and his donkey, only they use three letters instead of D-O-N-K-E, instead of six. And I've always told people, and I'm still that donkey. The difference is this one... Sherry agreed to let me live with her and marriage. They were all capital letters. And because of her and Jesus, they're lowercase now. The more I served her, the more I focused on her, the less I focused on me, the happier I became. You see, happiness is not found in focusing on yourself all the time. Now, sometimes you have to. Can I tell you that? Sometimes you do have to focus on yourself. But here's the deal. Bob Dylan might not have been right about a lot of things, but he was right about the song he wrote many years ago called You Gotta Serve Somebody. And that last verse is really dumb, to be honest. It goes like this. You can call me Terry. You can call me Timmy. You can call me Bobby or you can call me Zimmy. Really high level scholastic material right there, I want to tell you. You may call me RJ. You may call me Ray. You may call me anything, but no matter what you say, and here's the line, you're still going to have to serve somebody. Well, if I'm going to serve somebody, I want to serve God and I want to do it with joy in my heart. Doesn't mean I always understand it all. I don't doesn't mean that sometimes it isn't overwhelming because sometimes it is. Well, the third thing is this. Knowing God personally. Know that the Lord, he is God. You say, well, yeah, we all know that. Well, here's the key in that. The word know doesn't mean something intellectual. It means relational. You know, I, I knew Sherry and, I, and got to know her better and better, and then we got married. Then you really get to know a person. And she did have faults. I mean, she would squeeze the toothpaste in the middle of the tube. I hate that. Don't do that. There's got to be an unwritten rule somewhere. I'm sure in heaven, people go, I'm ready to go in. No, you squeeze the toothpaste tube in the middle. You go back for a while until you can learn how to squeeze that toothpaste tube from the very end. I found out that some days she would go in there when I wasn't looking and grab the toothpaste tube in the middle, especially if I irritated her. <laughs> squeeze it right in the middle so it was all wrinkled up and there was toothpaste in the bottom. I said, that's not very nice. That's not Christian. Stop that. And then I would go in and carefully pinch it all back uh, She finally said, you know what? I think we should get a pump. Because then we didn't have any more disagreements over who squeezed the toothpaste, where they squeezed it. You say, boy, she doesn't know how to choose a man, does she? I said, no, she did not. Look what she got. But to know means a relational knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge. Uh, It's the difference between reading about God in in the Bible and knowing God personally. It's heart knowledge, not head knowledge. Well, it's also thanking God humbly. Now, I love Thanksgiving, not particularly the holiday. Now, the holiday is good, too, because you can't really corrupt that. But I don't mean, you know, gathering around the table and eating dry turkey. I don't know what they do to those turkeys, but they're like shoes, and I don't particularly like eating shoes. I have plenty of shoes at home. I could eat them by myself if I wanted But what I love is the whole idea of thanksgiving because it keeps me and it keeps you and it keeps everyone else from becoming bitter. It makes us better because it takes our focus off of ourselves. Now, there are folks in this world that struggle with thanksgiving, with gratitude. And for us living in America, we have so much to be grateful for, we can't even keep track. 
I heard about a pastor, and I'm going to warn you ahead of time. Don't take this. I've had this go both ways, okay? This is not me. But he had a woman in his congregation. That's the part I don't want you going, really? It had to be a woman, okay? I've had men too, but this is not about me. I want to clarify that because I really want to go home with both of my eyes not swollen shut by the women in the church pounding me upside the head. Um, And the people on watching me online going, what? I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Calm down. So she would just attack him. And you may find this unbelievable, but there are people sometimes in God's kingdom that think their gift is to make sure their pastor is really humble. Now, when I say humble, I don't mean what the Bible says. I mean they want to make sure they're humbled. And they will send nasty letters. They will make nasty phone calls. Um, They will say nasty things to the pastor's face. Well, this young pastor had a prisoner like that. And it started to get to him. And he didn't know what he was going to do. And so he called up his father-in-law. I'm going to tell you right now, don't do this. Okay, don't do this. And he said, I'll tell you what you need to do. Next time she comes to the front of the church and starts to criticize and condemn and just wholesale you right there, you just say to her, I think we should pray. And then you can kneel right there at the altar. And this is what you pray. Don't do this. Don't do this. Dear God, I want to thank you that this lady is not my wife. Don't do that. That will get you in a lot of trouble, okay? Um, So, you know, try to enter God's presence, his gates, with thanksgiving. Um, Not like that, all right? That's not a very nice thing to do. And praise God continuously. I'll tell you what, you, you, you be grateful to God, you live in gratitude, you praise God constantly, and it will change who you are. The word there for praise is, means to be excited with great joy. I don't think I need to explain to you that we live in a dark world, right? You all know that. Now, to be honest, we've always lived in a dark world. It's just that now it seems like we're getting our share. But when you live in a dark place, as the saying goes, the darker the night, the brighter the light. As we live our lives in praise and gratitude to God, does it mean our lives will get real easy? No, it doesn't. To mean we're then somehow immune. We've received a vaccine against pain and suffering and turmoil and disappointment. No, it does not. But when we concentrate on the ability to thank God for what, who God is, first of all. For who God is to each one of us. What's the old saying? God is good all the time, and all the time what? God is good. I try to remind myself of that. Often. When things don't go the way that I think they should, I remind myself that God is good all the time. Even when I don't understand it. I want to live my life, and I know you do too, up close and personal with an unbelievable God. I close with this illustration or a story about a young naval officer that was uh, making his first trip on a destroyer and um, he wanted to do everything just right. He was very bright, um, had a bright future in front of him and um, he was barking commands right and left and everything was moving like a Swiss clock and the destroyer made it out of the harbor with not so much as a misstep, and and was a very difficult maneuver. And then he received this message from the captain. 
He thought it was strange because it was a radio message, but he read it, and this is what it said. Commander, you have done an excellent job. You have done it with great speed and with dispatch. You dotted your I's and crossed your T's. You have gone by the book, but there is one unwritten rule that you have overlooked, and I must call it to your attention. The next time you leave the harbor, make sure the captain's on board. And I tell you, in your life, in our, my own life, doesn't matter how wise we think we are or, or anything else, just make sure that the captain of our souls is always on board. And live your lives with gratitude and with praise for the God that walks with us each day. I'm going to ask that you would, at this time, you have um, various prayer concerns that are listed on one page of your worship folder. I'm not going to read all those because, again, you know them better than I. And um, you have your own prayer concerns. So as you bow your heads and um, offer quiet prayers to God, let us remember those. And then I will pray, and then together we will pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Let's pray. Holy and ever-present God, we thank you that you walk with us each day. Now, I don't know what will happen in heaven any more than anybody else does, but I have this suspicion that when we get to that great reunion time and we realize with, with per perfect clarity who you really are, the kind of power that you possess, the amount of love and grace and compassion, forgiveness and mercy that you so quickly dispatch to us when we need it. I don't think we'll have too much trouble praising your name. I don't know what I'll do when I walk in those gates. I have a suspicion that it'll fall on my face. Because when I encounter your presence, your greatness, I think that will be a natural reaction. And then I have a suspicion that I'll reflect on my own life and think, man, why didn't I spend a little more time praising you and thanking you and being less intimidated by what others might think if I'm a little enthusiastic? There's no way in this life that we can fully comprehend who you are. But one day, we will know and be known. So help us in this life to give you more credit, more praise, more thanks, so that those who live around us begin to notice that the way we live our lives and the outlook that we possess is a little different than the rest of the world. We thank you for what you have done in the past in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing now and what you will do in the future. The way that you are changing us to be more like Jesus, we certainly appreciate it. And we want you to keep on working in us making us more like him. We thank you for all that Jesus did and taught when he was on this earth. We thank you for his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And one day he'll return. We don't know when. 
doesn't really matter, to be honest. We thank you for all of that. And we thank you that when the disciples asked, Lord, teach us how to pray, you responded with this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time we will prepare for the receiving of God's tithes and offerings. Would you stand for the doxology, please? If you would remain standing for the closing hymn, it is Beneath the Cross, page 297. Sin will self my only shame. 
you go from this place of worship, go in the presence of the Lord, be a light in the darkness, and never cease praising and thanking him. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed. Thank you.